not. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to show you guys some stuff. So uh, do you think we have enough people to get into this? Yeah, I think we can go ahead. Okay. I'll just, I'll continue uh, admitting people in. Um, so, so again, this is, uh, this is the Marine Lab at Concordia University, Irvine. Um, and we are uh, hosting this remotely. Uh, Parker is the student lab manager and he is on campus um, helping us out with this. And then I'm Dr. Binyami, I'm the director of the Marine Lab. I'm at home. Um, so we're gonna let Parker go ahead and take it away. Go ahead and if you want, you can, you can pin your video to Parker's screen or you can have active speaker on there. And what we're going to do is during this uh, event, we're going to be uh, listening to Parker and then everyone is gonna be muted. But if you do have a question, I will be uh, checking out the, the chat forum uh, so you can post your question in the chat and either I will try to answer it there in the chat or we may take a couple breaks uh, in the middle or at the end and um, and go ahead and answer those questions verbally. We can we can uh, have Parker answer a few of those questions too. Um, so go ahead Parker and, and take it away. All right, so uh, you guys will follow me. I'm going to take you to our sand tank right here. And I'm gonna show you something that many of you guys, you guys have probably seen or even felt, unfortunately, which is the round stingray they have. So we have to find him in the sand first and I'm gonna use some tongs right here so I don't get so Okay, Matt, if you can zoom in right here, take a look at that. The stingray itself is right here. This is his outline. And if you look really closely, you can see his eye right there and his spherical right behind. The spherical helps uh, uh, continue water flow so that he can breathe when he's buried underneath the sand. So what I'm going to do, oh, here he comes. There he goes. So many of you might have, uh, or some of you might have gotten stung by one of these. Uh, they do have a sting on the end of their tail. Um, which is which is barbed and has venom on it. Um, they are commonly found along Seal Beach, which actually has some of the most stings in in the nation. Um, and they uh, typically dwell in the sand. Um, as as you saw, they're very they're very good at camouflaging themselves and um, keeping keeping out of sight of from predators. And as you guys saw here, and I'm going to try to pull him out, you guys can see how he swims. He moves his pectoral fins up and down in a, in a wave-like motion which propels him forward. You can see some of that. And if you look really closely, I don't know if you guys can um, see very well, he does have um, spots on his back which help with the camouflage in the sand. They're, they're slightly different colored, but you guys might be able to see. And what I'm gonna do right here is I'm gonna feed him so you guys see how they eat. So their mouths are underneath their bodies. And so they have to kind of engulf the food that they come across. So I'm gonna get him out of this corner right here. <laughs> he might be a little angry at us, but we'll see if he'll take some food. These guys usually do. Oh, buddy. Maybe not. They just ate yesterday, so they might not be very hungry. And we actually have to keep. Uh... Oh, there he goes. He just got it. So their mouths are underneath them, so they have to go over whatever food they have. Um, and actually, they they uh, um, suck water through their mouth and exhale it out the spiracle. Um, and sometimes we uh, feed him shrimp and the shrimp antenna gets stuck in his spiracle. So he's got a little antenna sticking out of the top of him. I'll go and feed him again. Yeah, he might not be that hungry. I'm gonna do one more. Awesome. Yeah, he eats a lot. He loves to eat. He usually steals the food from, from the other animals if he gets the opportunity. Um, so right now I'm going to pull out something that you guys probably have seen before. 
uh, we typically bring them to the touch tank events that we have. And I just have to find one real quick. Everything that we have in this tank lives underneath the sand. Um, that's how they camouflage and stay away from predators. So right here, this is a species of sand star. Um, these are different th from sea stars as they uh, actually burrow themselves underneath the sand and they actually have these spikes on their arms. Um, if I flip them over, you guys can see the tube feet that you have probably heard about if you have ever come to one of our events. These tube feet help uh, move the uh, starfish around and they also um, can suck onto surfaces. So you can see, especially in our other tank, the starfish uh, tend to hang onto the walls or onto different rocks and these tube feet help uh, stick them onto it. If you guys can see, Right in the middle here is their mouth. And what they end up doing when they, when they go to eat is they um, will push their stomachs out and they, they digest the food outside their body. Um, since they, you can see, you can't really fit a big piece of meat or anything in this small body. So they have to push it all out and slowly digest it over some time. Um, what sand stars do to catch their prey, uh, they, they typically eat uh, already dead animals, but to get a hold of it, they take their arms and push them together. And these spikes right here act as little uh, uh, grips to that food so they can, they can hold on to it. It's like, it's like a very, very long fork that, that clasps together. I'll give them some water real quick. And then I'll move to one of our other tanks. This is a, a rocky habitat tank, kind of like an intertidal zone. And I'll show you some of the starfish that we have here. And you, can, you can see the difference between the sea star right here and the sand star. This is uh, specifically a bat star. Uh, it's a type of sea star that you can find commonly uh, along the coast here. And they have, they're known for their uh, disproportionately large bodies to their uh, small arms. Um, if I flip them over, you guys can see the similar tube feet that they have. Uh, this guys are a different color, but they're still in there. And they, they help them stick to rocks to keep, uh, keep them steady from the waves that come crashing in when the high tide comes in. These guys typically live in intertidal zones um, where big waves, there, there can be huge waves. And we, we, we've seen that especially at Shaw's Cove, if you guys have ever been there, um, on a particularly high tide, it, it can get pretty messy. I've been uh, washed up in one of those one time during uh, one of our research, uh, research events. And here you can, you can kind of see, um, some of his stomach that has come out. They were just eating a little while ago, so it's still kind of out. It's these, uh, this whitish clear area right here. Um, and his, his mouth is also in here. And if you guys can see closely, I don't know if you can, there are actually symbiotic worms that live in, uh, on the surface of these sea cells. And they, they kind of burrow through uh, the different parts of their skin. And what they end up doing is they eat uh, any, any parasites or remnants of food that live on there and they keep them clean, nice and clean. So I'll put this guy back and I'll show you um, another, another one that we have, which is actually, uh, it's, it's a mutant. It has six arms instead of five. This is one of my favorite ones. I think it's really pretty. Oh, you guys can see right here. So this is the shrimp that I fed him yesterday. And you see the white on the outside, that's his stomach pushing, pushing out from his body and dissolving the food on the outside. Um, this is a, a piece of shrimp that I fed to them yesterday. And um, I'm sure he's enjoying it very much. <laughs> yeah, you guys can see he's got six arms right here. And what's interesting about sea stars is some of them can actually regrow their limbs if, um, if one gets uh, severed or cut off. 
Um, some, some species cannot do that, but they can continue on living. Um, and what's really sad actually is, I don't, I don't know if any of you have heard of the sea star wasting disease pandemic that hit the west coast of um, the United States in about 2013, 2014, but uh, it's, it's still unknown whether it's a virus or a bacterial infection. However, what ends up happening is the sea stars actually tear their arms off and they slowly start to decay. And this has wiped out millions and millions of sea stars along the west coast here. Um, we're starting to see some uh, uh, improvement in population density. However, uh, it's still nowhere near as where it used to be. So now I'll head over to our grazer tank. And these guys are also uh, contributing to another another issue on the west coast here. And I'll show you real quick. These are sea urchins. We usually bring these with us as well. You guys have probably seen these before. And what's really what's really nice about these guys is they uh, they are named based off of what color they are. So right here we have a red sea urchin. Over here we have a black urchin, and in the corner over there there are purple urchins. So I'll show you guys this one right now. Um, sea urchins are found all over the world. Um, some have poisonous spines, others do not. These ones obviously do not, as I'm consistent, I'm okay. Um, they are pretty pointy though, and will go through your skin if you, if you step on them, which can be pretty painful. Um, and what their spines do is they help, well, they obviously are for protection, and they also help uh, the urchin grab on to different kinds of food. So what urchins eat, uh, they eat kelp, which is the kind of seaweed that we have here. Uh, and what ends up happening is they clasp down, kind of like sort of the starfish do with their arms, but they do this with their spines. And they hold it and move it all the way down to their mouth right below. You can see in here, that's their mouth. And he might poke out his teeth. He has three teeth, or sorry, five teeth. I don't know if you guys are able to see that. Yeah, here he comes. So he's opening and closing them. These guys also have two feet, uh, just like the um, sea stars. However, they are located all over their body, not just on the bottom. Um, those also help uh, hold on to food and help stick to different surfaces. As you can see right here, this guy is on the wall. And if you want to look, Gonna move the camera this way. You can see those two feet sticking to the wall. They're they're the smaller, smaller ones that are holding on. And there are some even protruding out over here. Just stuck to my finger. Awesome. So now I'll show you the purple sea urchins that we have. And these guys are contributing to massive kelp deforestation along the west coast. Oh, you can see he's eating some kelp right now. So sea urchins, uh, particularly the purple urchins, um, they are eating massive amounts of kelp forests that we have here. Kelp forests, kelp forests are very important uh, to the ecosystems and biodiversity along the west coast as they are, they, they're a habitat for many different kinds of uh, fish, vertebrates, um, uh, even, even some, some different kinds of whales, gray whales, killer whales, um, and many invertebrates as well, like invertebrates like the sea urchins or snails or the sea cucumbers, things that don't have uh, a backbone. Um, but these guys in particular, are uh, eating away much of the kelp that's left over from um, that, that could survive the, the warmer temperatures that we've been having in the ocean since about 2013, 2014. Um, and what, what, once, they, once they eat a significant chunk of that kelp forest, um, they can actually continue to
Okay. So, folks, right now it looks like Parker uh, might have frozen up on us a little bit. So we're going to uh, give him a second to to get back on here, and um, hopefully we'll be able to have him back on here quickly. Um, some of you have been asking some questions in the in the chat window, so so keep up with the questions. Um, there's lots to learn about these animals, so we can't possibly present all of it right now during the uh, the field trip but we can try to answer as many questions as possible. Okay, we good? Parker, I can hear you now. Awesome, okay. Let me go back into the lab. Let's see. There we go, yeah, we can see you. Awesome. Parts, All right, so I'm going to hand the camera over. There's some parts of our labs that don't uh, that don't have very good reception for our Wi-Fi, so um, we'll try to make it work as best as possible. I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you, Parker. Awesome. Great. So I'll uh, get back to where I think I think the connection cut off. Um, sea urchins they uh, can go on living without food for a, a decent amount of time. Um, what they do is they eat the reproductive organ that's inside of them. Most of their meat is uh, their uh, genital tissue, which is the reproductive organ, and they will eat that up until they can find another source of food. And they can actually even go on living for a little while after uh, the genital tissue is eaten all the way. Um, so getting rid of these animals is pretty difficult um, because Fishermen don't want them because they they don't have any meat inside because they um, have eaten the forest already and then um, they've gone so long that they don't even have any meat because they eat their own. Um, so they're, it, it's a very tricky situation uh, trying to figure out what the best way to deal with this is. Um, there are, there, there's currently uh, a project going on where they will take the urchins out and then bring them to a facility kind of like this where they will fatten them up and then sell them to different markets um, as food, uh, which, which people, people love to eat. So hopefully, um, hopefully in the near future, we can see the population start to come back uh, and bring, bring the biodiversity back to the, to the West Coast. And right now, I will show you guys one of my favorite animals that we have here. This is the horn shark. You can see her right there. Uh, we named her Monica. Um, and she is a type of shark that uh, is actually pretty small. Uh, you know, we, don't have, we don't have big enough facilities here to have uh, some of the larger sharks you guys are fam probably familiar, familiar with. Um, but what's significant about this shark is they actually have uh, one of the greatest bite force um, size, bite force ratio of bite force to size um, out of any shark. And they're actually called horn sharks because uh, of the shape of their head. You guys can kind of see it's, um, they have these uh, prominent ridges over their eyes. Um, and it's, it's actually kind of funny because they, they actually have horns, quote unquote horns, on their dorsal fins on the top. They have two of them. However, that's, that's not why they're named. Um, these guys also have uh, two different kinds of teeth in their mouth. They have a set of thick molars in the back, and then they also have sharp teeth in the front. And this allows them to eat different kinds of animals and have a wider variety of uh, diet. Um, they typically eat mollusks, like um, mussels or clams that they find in, in the sand. And they can also eat bony fish and invertebrates. So I'm gonna watch you, uh, allow you guys to see how she eats. And she uses a sucking motion by pulling water through her gills and mouth, which allows her to suck the food in. So if I get her out here, maybe, come here. <laughs> she smells the food, knows it's coming. There you go. 
of swallows it whole. <laughs> Um, with with uh, different kinds of clams and mussels, however, they can't swallow the entire thing whole, so um, they have to crush them down with those molars first. And she's she's still even uh, trying to fit all that in her mouth. It was a pretty big piece. <laughs> I'm sure she's happy that she's full now, though. All right, and I'll put this back down. Horn sharks can um, grow to about three to four feet in length. Um, this one is uh, about the length that she'll get. She's around two and a half feet, I believe. And they can live up to, I believe it's 25 years in captivity. Or maybe 12. <laughs> I, for, I forget my statistics. <laughs> um, but they, they live for a decent amount of time. And these are also uh, sharks that you can find in kelp forests. Um, everything here you can find on uh, the west coast of Southern California. Um, as we, we typically get most of our animals offshore of Dana Point at a, uh, at a little secret reef that we found. And all, all the animals that we have here are for uh, educational purposes and research. So some of these guys we use in our classes like uh, evolutionary, evolutionary zoology, um, which uh, help us help the students uh, see what what they're what they're learning about what they're studying up up close and personal instead of just learning about it in in a book all right and now i'll take you guys over to um another one of my favorites that we have uh which is the small shark so here we actually have somewhat of a small shark hatchery we have three babies um and two adults uh, the one right here, he's about six years old and was actually born in our lab. And then the other one down in that corner over there, uh, we don't know how old she is. We caught her in the wild as an adult. Um, so we're, we're unsure, but uh, they are very, very fun and charismatic, um, charismatic sharks. This guy in particular is, is pretty mean sometimes and will to try to try to bite the other fish that he's around um same with same with the other one but you know they're sharks <laughs> what do you expect so i'll uh, i'll try to feed this guy real quick and you can see sort of what that looks like these guys have a set of teeth along uh in the front of their jaws and they're just they're just small sharp teeth which uh, just allow them to grab onto things and they they actually have really big mouths um, they have a, a larger ratio of mouth size to total uh, total size than even a great white shark um, so they're, they're able to fit a good amount of stuff in their mouth oh there they go <laughs> accidentally bit her tail and here comes the big one. Oh man <laughs> you guys are getting you guys are getting a good show today it's very rare that they end up uh, fighting over food. Oh man, into those rocks. So swell sharks are actually called swell sharks because of uh, a technique that they use to get away from predators and to intimidate predators. So what they do is they take the uh, their tail, their caudal fin, and wrap it around in sort of a in sort of a U shape like this and they'll they'll bite their tail and then swallow a ton of water and it it swells them up that's why they're called swell sharks and what happens is it prevents other predators from pulling them out from underneath uh, the rocks that they're hiding in and it can also intimidate some as well as you know a lot of animals uh, use the technique of uh, getting looking looking bigger than they actually are so that it scares the predator away and I'll see if I can feed Helen real quick, our other one. She's really feisty too. I'm trying to bring her over here so you guys can see. And there she goes. She'll even spit water at us sometimes by uh, opening and closing her mouth at the surface of the water when she's hungry. Telling us that she wants, she wants food, she wants to eat. And that's, that's about the max size that they'll get, um, what you guys are looking at right now. They're not very big sharks, but uh, 
Um, in our tank, she's she's pretty large. And hopefully, hopefully our other ones will uh, get to be that big someday. And I'll go ahead and show you guys uh, really quick the babies that we have, the pups, and the egg cases. So we have three of them here, and they're, they're actually smelled the food, so they're uh, going into a bit of a frenzy. Um, these were born about one year ago in our lab, and I'll show you guys the egg sacs from these egg sacs. So these are, um, yeah, yeah, right, baby, <laughs> the baby shark song. You can't tell you how many times I've heard that one. <laughs> um, these guys are uh, born from these egg sacs, and they um, are actually called mermaid purses. That's you know, the common name. Um, and these strings on the end will uh, get caught on rocks to prevent them from uh, um, being carried away by the waves and the swell underneath the water so that they kind of stay in the same area under underwater because if the shark is born on land or um, the egg washes up on land, then <laughs> they're, they're not going to survive for very long because sharks breathe water, not air. Um, so if you guys ever see one of these on the beach, which sometimes you do, and there's a shark inside, go ahead and throw it back in the water so um, maybe that guy has a, has, a, has a chance to live. Yeah, no, no, no. So I, I have one of the sharks um, in a different tank in, in another room. So they're, they're all alive. They're all healthy. They're happy. Um, I just, I had to move one to a different spot and I'm going to have to move these guys too uh, pretty soon because they are getting big quickly and are getting a little, a little big to the, the tank that they're in right now. So that might be coming soon to the, to the marine lab as a new, a new baby shark tank. Um, so now I'll show you guys another one of my favorites, which is the moray eel. This guy is a beast. He is huge. And we have to keep this uh, uh, little protection over the tank to keep him from coming out and biting us. Um, this guy is uh, probably as big as he's going to get in our, in our lab here, but in the wild, they can get much bigger. Um, what's significant about eels is that they actually have two sets of jaws. So I'll go ahead and turn this air off so you guys can see better. Um, they have one set of jaws in the front for biting down and gripping their food. And then they also have a second set in their throats, which um, come out into their mouth to pull the food into their stomach. Uh, it's, if you guys have ever seen the movie Alien, it's, it's kind of like the, the xenomorph jaws a little bit, except that it doesn't come out that far. <laughs> I'll go ahead and feed him to show you guys what that's like. So he grabs it with his first set of jaws. He likes to go down into his hiding spot. And then with his second set, he grabs it in his mouth and pulls it down into the stomach. He's working on that right now. Nice. Good job, buddy. So eels also don't have, um, they, they're unable to push water through their gills automatically. So what they have to do is they have to open and close their mouth um, pretty frequently so that they can breathe. Yeah, he's doing it right now. Awesome. Okay, so now I'll show you guys um, some of the components of our system. It takes a lot to run a marine lab or even a tank at home because you have to uh, try to mimic the environment that they're naturally found in uh, to the best of your ability or else they're not going to be too happy. Uh, water to uh, marine animals is like air to us. Um, that's what they breathe and if the water is not clean they have a hard time breathing. Uh, just like in Cal Southern California here we're not exactly known for our pristine air um, but, 
it, it can it can affect the health of some individuals sometimes. So we have to make sure that the water here is as clean as it can be for these animals so that they can stay happy and healthy. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, we'll move out here. Hopefully we can maintain connection. Um, and I'll show you guys one of the filtering, uh, a couple of the filtering things that we have here. So this whole rig right here is called a protein skimmer. And what the protein skimmer does is there is a, uh, a chamber of water in here and it goes all the way down. And then there's also a pump at the bottom which uh, creates air bubbles which uh, circulate and spin all the way to the top. And if you guys can see in here, it creates a, a foam that gets pushed out and it goes up and over that uh, center, uh, center cylinder in there. Um, and what the foam does is it takes away uh, particles of poop <laughs> because uh, animals poop just like us and we have to take it out of the system. And you, you guys can see it's pretty, pretty dirty in here. And I just, I just cleaned this the other day uh, and it's already, it's already dirty because they, uh, they go to the bathroom a lot. Um, so this, this helps us remove some of the uh, particles of uh, waste that we can't scoop out ourselves. And then once, once the water is filtered and cleaned, it moves through this pipe right here and goes down into our sump. Uh, and the sump is another huge component of uh, aquari aquatic systems as they uh, allow you to have more water than you would with that one. And they're also a good, a good hot spot for different types of filtering systems. So most of our, uh, like the, the machine that, sorry, we have construction going on in our building right now. We're uh, repainting, so it might be a little loud, I'm sorry. Um, the chiller goes, uh, it pulls water through cools it and then puts it back into the sump. And then we also have here some UV sterilizers, which act as sunlight. So the water goes through, it goes up and down these tubes, comes back around and gets put right back into our main system. Um, and then on the other side of the wall, I would, I would go there, but our connection uh, dropped right when I, right when I leave. Uh, we also have our main pump, which pushes all the water through uh, the system, and we also have a mechanical filter, which is this big, it's a barrel with little tiny beads in it that um, allow bacteria to grow. So uh, bacteria are also a really important part of the aquarium system because they're it's found in the ocean, and they help uh, convert different types of harmful nutrients, uh, specifically like ammonia, which you can find directly from waste, um, nitrite and nitrate. Um, so different types of bacteria will convert different things. And eventually you want to end up with nitrogen gas, which um, is the safest form of all of those. So we, we try here to mimic as much as possible uh, the natural environment that uh, all these animals are found in. And right here, Some of the algae that converts nitrates into nitrogen gas, and this is this is a refugium reactor. Uh, it's pretty cool. What it does is there's a, a light that goes through the middle, and that light acts as the sun for different kinds of algae that I have in here. And those algae help clean the water out, and it takes it takes bad nutrients out of the water so that the fish can uh, be happy and healthy. And it's pretty cool. It's really, it's really awesome. How much time do we have left? And then we can go to questions. So uh, over here, we have the starburst anemone. Anemone, <laughs> I, always have, I always have a difficult time saying that, probably, probably like most people. Uh, if you guys have ever seen Nemo, he has, he has a hard time with that too. Um, anemones are, one of my favorite invertebrates. They're invertebrates because they don't have a backbone. They're all they're really squishy all over the place. Um, 
And you can find these guys in tide pool communities all along the coast. Um, we have a ton of them here. Ours are a little bit less green because they don't have as much algae growing on them as uh, the other ones in the wild. Hi everyone, I think uh, Parker is gonna be restarting his connection here uh, because the, the video feed cut out a little bit. Um, I went ahead and shut down the chat window because uh, people weren't being mature enough with their comments and their questions. So instead what we're gonna do is uh, if someone has a question, uh, they can go ahead and raise their hand and then um, we can uh, individually have them be able to ask, uh, ask a question in their chat window. All right, so it looks like Parker is coming back on here. There we go. We're getting hooked back up. Now, the reason uh, Parker is there on campus is because, um, as he was saying, the Marine Lab takes a lot of uh, a lot of work to keep it running. So. He volunteered to, instead of going home, he decided to stay on campus. Um, so he's living in the dorms and he's been helping us uh, run the marine lab and keep the animals healthy and safe uh, while the rest of us have been stuck at home and in quarantine. So, and his assistant there, Matt, is another one of our students. He manages our, our garden on campus. Some of you have been to that garden before. So, um, they're both working together to keep our facilities running while we're uh, under quarantine here. Parker, go ahead and take it away. We got you back again. Oh, there we go. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, so I'll uh, get back to the anemones. Um, the way that they eat is they actually let the fish run right into them and they eat, uh, fish, crustaceans, whatever, whatever comes across and they can eat. So the fish will swim right into their arms and tentacles and they pull it down into their mouth, which is right in the center. Um, and these, uh, these arms are actually uh, toxic. They have uh, poison on them. However, um, they don't affect us very much because we're, we're so big and our, our skin is pretty pretty thick and prevents us from feeling any of that. Um, but you can get a rash if you, if you leave it on for too long, which I'm not gonna do. Um, this is one of just the uh, few types of anemones that we have here. I also have uh, a tube anemone and um, um, it's purple, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you that. Um, Anemones are, anemones are great and hopefully you guys can go to um, some of the intertidal zones that we have here and, and see all of these awesome animals, animals that we have. Um, and if you look in this tank right here, I'll show you guys real quick before questions. Um, these are some of the uh, bony fish that you can find in kelp forest. This right here is a giant kelp fish. And you guys can see he actually uh, kind of changed color a little bit since you last saw him when we were checking out the horn shark because they actually do change their color. Um, they can change from dark green to uh, kind of a, a green with darker stripes, uh, a little bit of a reddish brown, and also silver. Um, these are um, correspond to different types of algae that we have here and they can, they can change their color to best fit the environment around them so that they can stay camouflaged. And right here, the pink fish, you can see that is the California sheephead. And these guys are really cool because they actually can change their gender um, as, they, as they get older. 
they typically stay in larger groups with one male. And if that male happens to die, one of the females has to take the spot. And so they change their body shape. Oh, <laughs> he's really, she's really aggressive too. Um, they change their body shape. Uh, they grow much bigger. And they also uh, get a protruding forehead and change color a little bit. They get uh, blue stripes on the front and towards the back of their bodies. And then down at the bottom, that orange fish, that is the Garibaldi, the California state fish. Uh, we used to have a much bigger one, but he, <laughs> he sadly got in a, in, a, in a fight with the eel and he is no longer with us anymore. Um, but that, that's just nature of the life cycle and that's what happens when you put a fish in a tank with a moray eel. Uh, so we have this guy in, in, a, in a tank with a few other fish and a, a pretty docile shark. So he's, he's doing okay. Um, we caught him recently last year and hopefully we can throw him out to as big as we could get and have him for, have him for a long, long time. So, okay. Um, sorry if you guys are having uh, issues with hearing me. Our, our connection seems to be okay, but um, I've heard it's, it's breaking up. So I uh, apologize in advance for that again. Um, so now I'll go to any questions that you guys have. Um, Dr. Bignami, I'm not sure how you want to do this. I mean, Matt can read them to me or you can read them to me, whatever works. So right now I have the um, I have the chat window set to to um, send directly to me as a host. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So if you have a question, go ahead and um, send it to me. So we had a question from Kimberly, and she's uh, wondering if we have special permission to collect these animals. So could you maybe explain that uh, process? Yeah, we do. So um, most of these animals you are not pretty much all of them actually, you're not allowed to um, collect as a civilian, but we have a scientific collection permit, which allows us to go and get some of the animals that we need for um, research or uh, education. So we're only allowed to have a few of each animal at a time, depending on, depending on what it is. Um, like the uh, Garibaldi, for instance, we can only have two we can only take two per year, which is more than we need. Um, we only really need one, but uh, it, it allows us to get access to some of these guys. That, so we can so we can show all of you, um, educate and educate you guys, and, and use these for research if we need it. Um, but some of the other ones, like snails, uh, particularly snails that are not uh, they don't have any population density issues. Um, those are we can we can have a, a decent amount of those. So it just depends on the, the conservation status of, of each animal. But yes, we do have um, a specific permit that allows us to do so. Okay. Um, another question was asking if moray eels are endangered, and no, they're not. Um, and then another question that was asked was whether we have any crabs in the marine lab. Yeah. So. Uh, I keep most of our crabs in this tank right here. Some of them end up like the swimmer crabs. Some of them end up getting eaten by the starfish. Um, the other one we have, we have a red rock crab right here that's actually pretty small. And he usually hangs out. Yeah, here he is. I found him. So our red rock crab that we have is right in there. And I think, I believe he just molted recently, um, which means they, uh, they kind of like how snakes shed their skin, they pull out from their shell and uh, they grow a new one inside before they, before they molt. So they get too big for their shell on the other side. They have to leave it and make a new one. Uh, so I, I'm pretty sure he just did that. Um, but he's, he's slowly getting bigger over time. Uh, we also have swim, swimmer crabs that we commonly get from Newport here. Uh, however, those are, <laughs> those are usually the ones that get caught by the anemones, so we don't have any anymore. Um, we used to have a, a sheep crab. However, that uh, 
she reached her lifespan and um, died earlier this summer, I think, but um, she lived a happy life here. <laughs> most, most of our animals here are, are happy and healthy, and if, if not, then we treat them for whatever, however they need to be treated. Great. Uh, so there was a question, Parker, for you about what your favorite thing to do in the marine lab is when you're working there and what your least favorite thing to do is. Okay. Uh, my least favorite thing to do is probably harvesting brine shrimp or uh, siphoning out poop from the tanks. Uh, the poop is just, it, it's, a, it's a lot of work and it's kind of gross and you have to carry heavy five gallon buckets to the drain. Um, but the brine shrimp are actually, uh, they're these little tiny, tiny shrimps that we feed to some of the filter feeders that we have, like uh, some of the different anemones and uh, marble fish or uh, communal uh, polyp communities that would, I have in another tank in a different room. Um, that requires you to disassemble and put together uh, the setup every time and it, it, depending on how many setups you have it can take longer. Uh, we used to have two or three and now I'm only down to one um, but just because just I have less to feed but that, that's probably my least favorite thing to do and my favorite is I would say building new building new tanks and building new uh, structures for the lab so actually this this summer Hopefully we are going to start construction on a research rack that will be going in the back corner over there. Um, that's gonna have little tiny uh, small tanks that uh, students can do research in. They'll be able to do replicated studies. Um, and hopefully that'll, that'll get some more research going and help our students out with that. Um, another thing that we recently did was we moved all of our life support equipment outside the lab to, uh, make room for the research track actually. That happened uh, last fall. I love building things. I love um, making new homes for the animals that we have. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun and I think it's one of the best parts of working in the lab here. Great. Um, there were a couple other quick questions that I'll go ahead and answer. One was uh, why sea urchins have spines or spikes. Uh, and they have those primarily for protection from predators uh, so that the predator can't bite them without getting poked in the, in the nose. Um, another was whether sea stars can stick the people. And yes, they can. They can, uh, they can hold on to you with their tube feet. Those tube feet have a, a suction cup at the end of every one. And they can hold on pretty strongly. Uh, so if you let them really get a hold of you, they can sometimes be hard to pull off. But they don't hurt. So that's good. Um, there were a couple other questions um, that asked uh, if we would find any of these fish in a sushi restaurant. Uh, and you may, you may find a California sheephead in a sushi restaurant. Um, you would certainly find sea urchin in a sushi restaurant. That's uni. So if you've ever had uni, that's sea urchin. Um, so there are some of our fish that you would find in, in a sushi restaurant. Um, Parker. Let's uh, maybe finish off. Well, here we go. We have, do we have any animals outside in the water? Um, we don't have any animals uh, outside of the marine lab right now. Uh, we do have some other tanks and other rooms. Um, and uh, that is how we um, sort of get our animals out into the, um, into the rest of the campus since most people can't be inside the uh, the marine lab at, at all times. And then Parker, let's go ahead and finish on one last question, which was, what is your favorite animal in the marine lab? It looks like Parker might be working on getting the internet going again. There we go. You can see one of our labs is, uh, is getting remodeled right now. That's why the ceiling is torn apart. And the workers are in there right now laying the floors down. So we're getting a nice new laboratory space right next door to the Marine Lab for teaching our classes. Um, Parker is just a, uh, he just finished his second year at Concordia University. So um, he has two more years to go uh, and he's hopefully gonna be the Marine Lab manager that whole time uh, since he does such a great job with it.
So Parker, last question, and then we'll finish up the, the, the field trip. What is your favorite animal in the marine lab? And hopefully your video uh, keeps working for us. Okay. So is it, is it okay? Yep, it's all right. A little choppy, okay. but let's go with it. Okay, um, so my favorite animal uh, that we have here is Monica, our horn shark. I'm not sure why, uh, just the first day that I came in here, I automatically fell in love with her. Um, she's, she has such a great personality. Um, and they, they, they help, they help teach you that, uh, not all sharks are the vicious animals that people make them seem to be. Um, and I actually, I actually went as, as far as I could to, uh, get her on my body. Uh, this is actually a tattoo that I got last, last year of the horn shark that we have here. It's modeled after her. Um, I love her to death. And uh, I, I hope that uh, I'm able to work with them in the, in the future. They are, they're amazing animals, amazing sharks. And uh, I do love everything here, but um, she definitely has priority and is my favorite. Great, thank you, Parker. And uh, thank you to all the teachers and students who were able to log on from uh, Santiago Elementary. We have about 135 people in the call right now. So we hope you all enjoyed it. Um, we will try to make the recording of the, the field trip available as long as it all recorded okay. Um, and we'll try to send that link out to your teachers so that they can uh, pass that along to you. Um, if you have any questions um, or teachers, if you ever wanna have the Marine Lab do a virtual or an in-person, maybe someday in the future again, in-person field trip. You can look us up on the Concordia University webpage um, and you can find out more information about how we uh, go out to schools and provide free educational field trips. Uh, some of you have already done that. We've been in, coming to Santiago for a few years now. And, uh, and then finally, if you're interested in seeing what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you can follow us on Instagram at CUI underscore marine underscore lab and we post pictures there of us in the marine lab of our animals we also uh, send pictures when we're out in the in the field doing research uh, so out on the ocean um, so and we'll put we'll post fun facts about different animals uh, so go ahead and give us a follow on that and you can you can kind of check out what we do on a day-to-day -day basis so uh, thank you Parker I think we'll go ahead and end the meeting and uh, Everyone can uh, have a great last week of school and have a great summer. Awesome. Thanks for tuning in, guys.